me to Matthew chapter 6. We're talking about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is walking with his disciples. It's a very Jewish thing I've said over and over again. And they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. When you pray, miracles take place. Blind eyes take, open up. Gold coins come out of fish's mouth. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. This is something that is a a blueprint for how you and I are to pray every day. Now, um, last week I taught something that may be the hardest thing to do, and we talked about forgiving those who trespass against us. At the end of this service, when everybody leaves, we're going to stay, and after about 10 minutes, I'm going to do a leadership class on another level of forgiveness. It's an amazing revelation. But when it talks about forgiveness, it's probably the hardest thing in the Lord's Prayer to do. Today, I'm going to teach you something that will literally change your life, and it may be the hardest thing to understand in the Lord's Prayer until I show it to you today. So read with me in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 9. In this manner, Jesus said, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Every day God has provision for us. Forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who have our debtors, our sins, or we have sinned against. And do not lead us. Now, here's the part we're going to hit today. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I'm not going to reiterate all that we taught before because I want to get into this. Oh, before we do, they have, I forgot that I got to do this. They have eggs for you in the back when you leave. Maybe they gave it to you and you came in. These eggs have a piece of candy in them and an invite for somebody to come to resurrection service on Sunday. We want you to take these and pass them out. Do not steal the candy out of there and then grab, grab this. Ready? You ready? Invite somebody. Let's win the world to Jesus. Amen? Hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you an interesting thing. I'm going to tell you an interesting thing. When we, when we uh, the, uh, the nation of Israel asked us uh, last month, I guess it was, to show the video of what Hamas did on October 7th, the barbaric butchering that they did of 1,400 women and children and innocent people. And I showed it at the embassy in D.C., and we invited Christian leaders in. From that, uh, I have now been asked, uh, the first time in history, an evangelical to bring this video and show it to the Mormon community at the Capitol in Utah with the House and the Senate. So myself and the Israeli ambassador are going to go there and show this. There's, there's unity that's, that's, that's coming about. Amen? There's, there's a, an amazing thing that's taking place. And we're living in the last days. But, folks, I want you to be encouraged. I read in the book, We Win. And we're not going home with a moan. We're going out with a shout. And so there's a lot of amazing things taking place. Jesus says here, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I've been a Christian for, gosh, 48 years, I guess, something like that. And like I said, last week was probably the hardest thing to do, but this week, it may be the hardest thing to understand. Here the prayer is, if we read it the way we read it in English, it says, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Don't, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. And I love the way one person put it. Are we saying, God, back off? You're trying to tempt me. I need you to stop it. If God is doing something, it must be for our good. Why would we ask him to stop it? But we've got to understand how this really reads. Let me read James 1, 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does he himself 
tempt anyone. So God would never tempt us to commit a sin or do something against his word or against his will. Never. Can I have an amen? amen. Look at James 1, 2, and 3. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. Now, the word there really should be trials. So one, God says he can tempt no one. It's not in him to tempt anyone. And then he says, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken hold of you regardless of its source or entice you that is not common to every human experience. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able to bear, but with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So here we have scriptures that almost look like they are contrary to each other. One, it says temptation is good, count it joy. Another one says God cannot tempt us. And then what Jesus is teaching us to pray is, Lord, lead us not into temptation. And now here lies the problem with reading the Bible in English. Now, I know most of you know this, but a lot of people don't. Jesus did not speak English. Right? Now, the problem is, is that, and, and I did it for years and years, and, and it's okay, you can, get a, you can glean a few good things out of it, but what the leaders of the church did is they would say, now, in the Greek, this is what it means. Well, not only did Jesus not speak English, Jesus didn't speak Greek. So when we're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, whatever, you really cannot read it in English and find out what it means, and you can't read it in Greek. Jesus spoke a form of Aramaic. He, it's a, it's a com combination of ancient Hebrew and Aramaic. And even the Aramaic that Jesus spoke was from the area of Galilee, and so people in, in Jerusalem didn't understand everything Jesus was saying because he spoke a different dialogue. You know, I, I shared last week that in Australia they speak English, but they have words in English that are different from the same words that we have here meet a total different meaning. And so if we're going to find out what Jesus is saying, we really need to look at what he's saying in the original language. Now, we can read the Bible, we read it in English, and we can get a whole lot of stuff out of it. But when you read this and Jesus says, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil, you can't get any sense out of that reading it in English or Greek. You have to look at what it says in Aramaic or ancient Hebrew. Now, this phrase, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, is actually a phrase that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so when we look at this, it's actually saying, and I'm going to explain it in more detail, it actually is saying, Lord, do not allow us to enter into wrongful thinking or into situations that will bring us out of your will. So when Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, it's not God trying to tempt us because God cannot tempt us in anything that's evil because there is nothing that's evil in God. It's actually a prayer when you read it in the original language, he's saying, God, don't allow me to enter into anything that would tempt me to fall. Don't allow this to happen. Now, the word temptation, and here's where it changes. The word temptation here, lead us not into temptation, is the word yetzer hara. Yetzer hara. And yetzer hara means an evil inclination. Lord, don't allow the evil inclination in my life to get out of your will and do something that is not righteous. 
Now, the reason why Jesus says to pray this is because every one of us has an evil inclination. Every one of us do. We're born with evil inclination. Now, I, I used to think that wasn't true. I used to preach against this. You know, I think in Christianity they call it the Adamic nature, that every one of has us in us to do something wrong. And I said, no, no, we, we learn to do wrong. And, and as I studied this, I started thinking, you know what, they're right. It, we're born with the inclination to do good, but we're also born with the inclination to do wrong. It's in us. Now, I'm going to explain that why. This is called Yatsar Hara, the evil inclination. And I, I, I've told this story before, but years and years ago when we were pastoring in Australia and Luke was, uh, 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 what, three years old or something and Tiz pulls up to the gas station and Luke finds something on the ground and it's a broken piece of toy. It's junk. It should be in the trash. But he picks it up, and he puts it in his pocket, not telling Tiz. And when they walk into the gas station, Luke walks in like this. And Tiz says, what's in your pocket? And he goes, nothing. She said, what's in your pocket? And he pulls out. Now, it's junk. It's junk. But he sees value in it, thinks, well, should I have this or shouldn't I have it? So he hides it in her pocket, and she said, you give it to the man. The man says, oh, no, no, it's junk. She said, no, no, he needs to learn to do what's right. And so she said, when you get home, you're going to tell your father what to do, what you did. And so he had to come in, and, and I said, what would you do? And he goes, I stole. Well, nobody, he's three years old. Nobody taught him to steal. Nobody taught him to lie. That's the evil inclination that is in every one of us. Now, this is going to make sense in a minute. You know, when, when uh, um, I, think, I guess it was Anna started school, and she was in a room, and, and I was in my office. Ne my office was a bedroom next to their bedroom, and I could hear them laughing in there. And I said, you kids be quiet. You got to go to school. Go to sleep. And I hear Anna's little voice go, we are asleep. <laughs> Now, that's in every one of us, all right? So what he, the prayer is, Lord, I understand that there is this in me to do what's not your will. Don't allow me to get into a situation where I do something that is wrong. Genesis 6 says, the imagination of the heart of man is e evil, this is why when we receive Jesus, he circumcises our heart. Our heart, instead of doing things that are evil, our heart now goes in covenant with God, and we say, God, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Now, here's an interesting thing that I never learned before. Uh, I'm studying this. I'm studying this in, in, in Hebrew, and this is fascinating. It says this evil inclination that's in every human being, it's not a demonic force, but it is man's misuse of things that his physical self needs to survive. In other words, it's not always the devil. Now, sometimes we understand the devil causes people to do things, but sometimes, most of the time, it's not the devil. It's us deciding on our own, am I going to do what's right or am I going to do what's wrong? It's a decision that each and every one of us makes because these decisions are related not to bad things, but to good things. Give you an example. Money is a good thing. But if we cheat to get money, that's the evil inclination. Money's a good thing. But if we steal that money in order to take care of ourselves, then that good thing has turned into something that is bad. Sex is a good thing. God created sex. But if we have sex outside of the marriage, a good thing has been overtaken by our evil inclination. I'm going over to the fornicators over here. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Now watch this. This, this is really, really, really fascinating. 
These are not things that are bad. In the beginning, God created everything, and he said it's good. All these things, money, sexual relationships, um, um, gold and silver and the cattle and the oil and the world and the earth, it's all very good. But if we use the evil inclination in taking that, then what was good, meant to be good, becomes bad. In Hebrew, it says every one of us has a yetzer hara, which is the evil inclination, and everyone has a yetzer hatov, which is the evil inclination. In other words, every one of us, and, and I love the way it says it in ancient Jewish wisdom, when we're born, we're equal balance. We have the balance in us to do good, and we have the same balance to do evil. But as we grow, we're determining which one becomes stronger. You've all heard the story of, uh, of uh, uh, Chief Sitting Bull, and he's sitting with his grandchildren, and he says to them the story. He said, inside of me are two wolves. One is a white wolf, that is a wolf that wants to, wolf that wants to do good. One is a black wolf, a wolf that wants to do bad. And they fight with each other all the time. And the grandchildren said, well, grandfather, which one wins? He said, whichever one I feed the most. And that's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord, don't let us be put into a situation and at the same time, he'll not put us into a situation we can't handle. Don't let us be put in the situation where that evil wolf wins over the good wolf. Now watch this. It gets, it, it gets even, even better. How do, we, how do we defeat this evil inclination? How do we do it? Now, in every one of us, in every one of us, there is, when we're born... We, are, we have the equal amount of will to do good and will to do bad. We have that equal. How do we defeat that still small voice that tries to get us to do what's wrong? You know what? If you'll just lie a little, if you'll just gossip, if you'll just not forgive, if you'll just bend the rules, if you'll just do that. How do we do that? I read a story uh, out of ancient Jewish wisdom, and it says, this man comes to his rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, he said, I, I need you to help me. He said, that voice in me to do wrong, it's there all the time, that voice to lie or steal or cheat or, or be dishonest or, or hurt someone or cheat on your spouse or whatever it is, that voice, I, I, I can't get rid of it. Pray for me, Rabbi, that I can get rid of it. He said, no, I can't. I can't pray for you to get rid of it. That's, that's going to be there. But there is a magic word that every time you use this magic word, you defeat that evil. And he said, oh, Rabbi, that's wonderful. Tell me what that magic word is. The rabbi said, no. He said, well, but Rabbi, I want to defeat. I want to defeat this evil that tries to get me to do bad things. Tell me the magic word. And the rabbi said, no. And the man said, oh, and he starts to walk away, and he goes, where are you going? He goes, well, you won't tell me. He said, I already told you. The magic word is no. When the devil says, you know what? You can just cheat on this business deal a little bit. No. You know what? It, it, you're, you're, you can do this, and your wife or your husband won't find out. No. You know what, if you just, if you, if you just you know, get involved with this gossip a little bit, it'll make you feel so much better. No. That's the magic word. And every time you say no, God moves you up the ladder, moves your soul up the ladder to be more like Christ. There's another way to, say, to, to defeat this. They, they, they told the story of Joseph, and we know Joseph. He was sold by his brothers, thrown into a pit, and, and sold to Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife kept putting the moves on him. For over a year, she kept coming to him, and he'd say no, he'd say no, he'd say no, he'd say no. And she kept trying to do this and trying to do that, trying to get him to be immoral. And he said no, no, no. 
But there's part of that story in ancient Jewish wisdom said one time after a year, he was beginning to get weakened and she was, she was trying to get him to do this. And, and he, he was, he was, he was yielding to it. And he started to walk into her, into her bedchamber. And all of a sudden he saw a vision of his dad standing there. And his dad was watching the move he would make. And in ancient Jewish wisdom, it says, if you're getting ready to do something, give yourself a spiritual vision of your mentor or your leader or your father or whoever standing there watching what you're doing. And I thought, there's a better image. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So wherever you're going, just get an image of him standing there watching what you're doing. I'm going over to the... Amen? Just get an image that you're not in there by yourself or you're not doing this by yourself, that Jesus is standing there with you and he's watching everything you would do. The third way to defeat this, lead us not into temptation, Lord. Don't allow us to be put in some place, a situation that will stumble is you don't negotiate with evil. You don't negotiate. Well, you know, if I cheat on this, on this business deal a little bit, if I cheat on it, then there's just, there's just more tithe. I can remember when we first got saved, and, you know, on, on Wednesdays, we used to have testimony service. And uh, uh, one of the guys got up. He said, I want to give God praise, man. God gave me 300 and something dollars extra this week. Everybody, oh, praise God. He goes, yeah, I went and cashed a check, and the person at the bank gave me 300-something. They read it wrong and gave me too much money. And, of course, it sucked the wind right out of the service. And so, you know, the, I, I was with the pastor. and went up, and he said, he said, brother, that's, God didn't give you that money. Oh, no, I was praying, and I needed 300 extra, and, God, and I got it. No, God didn't give that. That little girl, that lady at the bank, she's going to have to pay for that. You got to go and give that back. He goes, well, I, I figured it was God, and I, you know, 10% is 30 to the church. <laughs> you don't negotiate with the evil. You say no to it. Come on, I need an amen. amen. And you stand up against this. You don't allow that, that, that evil dog to win in the fight. Now, here's, here's where it really gets interesting. Lord, don't allow me. Don't allow me. God will not allow us. Listen to me. God will not allow us to be put into a situation where we would backslide or do something wrong. He would not allow that if it's beyond what you can handle. That's what he says. He said, I'll never allow you to put the, be put in a situation that the temptation to do wrong is greater than anything that you can handle. So if, if I backslide, if I do wrong, it's not because the devil did it. It's because I said yes to what was wrong instead of saying no to what was wrong. Right? Are you with me? So it's not, oh, the, you know, I'm, I, anybody remember Flip Wilson? Yeah, I met Flip Wilson one time. We were down, we were in Albuquerque and we were out witnessing and he was there. I don't know what he was doing. He was on the back of a pickup truck and we talked to him and, and he goes, the devil made me do it. Remember that? The devil made, well, see, that's okay for Flip, but it's not okay for us. We cannot say the devil made me do it because this, this, is, this is something that's in us that the older we get in the Lord, the less times we ought to be stumbling, right? All right, now, do we have that? Okay, here's the good part. And then he says, he said, I'm not going to allow you to, I'm not going to allow anything to come against you that's so strong it'll make you stumble. So you have to, you're the one that has to make a decision to do right or wrong. You have to make that decision. Amen? Are we okay? Then he says, deliver us from evil. 
Now, I've always read that and say, okay, the devil's attacking my finances. The devil's attacking our health. The devil's attacking. Lord, deliver us from evil. And that works. That's good. You know, when, when the devil comes against us, we can bind him. We can come against him. But when you read it in the original and in the contents and the rhythm of the way it's said, when he's saying, Lord, Lead, don't allow me, don't allow me to, 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 to get into a situation that'll, that I will stumble and deliver me from evil. Deliver me from the evil that is in me so that my light of Christ outshines the darkness that I originated with. When, when we're born, we have equal good and equal evil. Equal good and evil. Go to sleep. We are sleeping. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've seen when, you know, when, when the, the plates are passing, I've seen people fake putting money into the plate. You know, like, we say, okay, don't forget now, 10th is large. It's like God goes. <laughs> God sees everything. Amen? But there's something in us. It's that... It's that evil inclination that, you know, we just want to, we just want to, we just want to fudge a little bit. We just want to do this. And he's saying, God, I know there's evil in me. Deliver that evil that's in me and get it out. When the Bible says, beloved, I would above all things that you prosper and be in health as your soul does prosper. This is exactly what he's talking about. Is, the, is, our, is our doing good outgrowing our doing evil? Is our doing right outgrowing our doing wrong? With our doing good, that's the growth of our soul where we begin to image Jesus, where we begin to mirror being the light of the world. So think about this. Every time, every time you're, you're placed in a situation, you, you and I, we have to make a decision. Are we going to do what's evil because it makes us feel good? Or are we going to do what's right because we know this is the will of God? Let me get, make it easy. You're getting ready to do a business deal. And somebody comes and says, you know what, if we just fudge a little bit, if we just, if we just, if we just fudge this a little bit, we're going to make X number of more dollars. Let me help you with that. Let me help you with making that decision. You can never steal as much as God wants to give you. Right? You can never steal as much. And so that's the devil who's trying to block your real blessing. He comes in that evil. It's in every one of us. It's in, in every one of us that, you know, if I do this, it's going to be better for me. It's not going to be better for me. It may look like it temporarily. It may feel like it temporarily, but it's the devil who comes and wants you to do that because he's going to block all the things that God really has waiting for us. You know, I, I thought, I wondered about using this, um, I wondered about using this illustration, but, you know, you think about, you think about what happened on October 7th with, um, with uh, Hamas and Israel and killing those babies and killing those children. And or you think about what happened in America on 9-11 and those planes flying into our buildings, our trade centers, and seeing people have to jump from 30 or 40 floors out. They're on fire. They're, they're on fire, and they're jumping out. And you think, you know what? This is, this is evil beyond reason. This is, this is evil beyond reason anything we can imagine how did people get to the point that they would do that kind of evil well it's because they've been feeding the evil dog instead of feeding the good dog 
So let's look at it, you and I, and this a terrible illustration. Forgive me, I, I, I battle even right now saying it. But you, you and I would never, you, you and I would, would never walk up to someone and kill that child. You know, but would you vote for someone who's pro-killing children? Well, if I, if I vote for this person, that, that political party is promising me all this stuff. So if I vote for them, even though I'm not killing that child, or you know what? I'm not trusting in the White House being Jehovah Jireh. I'm trusting in God being Jehovah Jireh. I'm trusting in God being Jehovah Jireh. Does that make sense? Okay, um... Well, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't kill some man or some woman. How would you get to that point? Would you kill their future by gossiping about them? That's evil. Now, we look at this and we go, that's evil in extreme. We understand that. But they had to start somewhere because everybody born is born equally evil and equally good. It's in all of us. And the answer is really this. Feed the good. When we see extreme evil, the way we counter that, doing extreme good. By doing extreme good. Amen? I, 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 can I be honest with you? You have, to bat, you, have to, you have to feed that dog daily. You know, when, when we, I can remember not many years ago when God put it on, on our heart as a ministry to start doing things in Israel, we scraped together, John, it wasn't that long ago, $10,000 and gave it to B'nai Zion Hospital for an emergency room for terrorist attacks. And that $10,000 was like, man, that was, that was, we were pushing the limit. Last year, you, you gave two point something million just for that, two point million. But I'm a, can I be real honest with you? Every time we're looking at that, or every month, we got to go, mm, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, we did that last year. You know, we could sure use a gymnasium for our youth and hold on to that two million. Is it okay for me to tell you that? And I have to make that, I have to make that decision. I'm going, over, I'm going over to Israel right uh, next week uh, after the service on Sunday, after Purim, and I'm going to meet with some folks that are wanting to build this hospital because the terrorist attacks, and they block the road so the Jews bleed to death on the road, and they want to build a hospital right there. And I said, let me come over and look at it. And so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we can give a million dollars. Maybe we can raise a million dollars. A million dollars. And I got to be honest with you, that... That black dog saying, you know what? You're not debt. You're not out of debt yet. What about you? But if we do what's right, God will take care of you and I. Does that, does that make sense? Does that make And so he says, Lord, don't don't allow it, don't, Lord, don't allow me to go into a position that uh, I'm gonna stumble. And God said, I won't allow that to happen. I'm not gonna allow you, I'm not gonna allow anything to come against you that will cause you to act against the will of God. So if I act against the will of God, it's my decision. And so the way to do that is say, you know what? I'm not even negotiating with this. This is, this is what God says. This is what the word of God says. This is what the devil's doing. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God's come to give me life and life more abundant. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Does that make sense? And then he, and then he says, get rid of the evil. Lord, get, and, and when I read that, I thought, man, Lord, get rid of the evil that's in me. Remove that evil that's in me. Remove that selfishness, that wanting the gossip, that wanting the backbite, the wanting to, to, to do this, to do that. You know, re remove, deliver me. You know, now I want God to deliver you of Israel, of evil, but I got to make sure I got the, the log out of my own eye before I try to get the splinter out of your eye. And so this just changed my life when I was sitting there last night. And I go, God, deliver me of evil. 
Let me, let me be the light of the world. Let us be the light of the world. Let us, wherever we go, people feel the goodness and the love and the mercy and the kindness of God. Let us be those kind of people. And I really believe this is part of the end time transfer of wealth, of signs and wonders and miracles, that if we lay hands on somebody and they get healed, God's going to get all the praise and all the glory. That if God takes the wealth of the wicked and puts it in your hands, that God can trust us with what he puts in our hands that we will do what's righteous. And let me tell you something. God wants you driving a nice car. God wants you living in a nice house. God wants you to be debt free. God wants you to wear nice clothes. God wants you to go on vacation. And the more we do what's right, the more he'll give us to do right with. Amen. And then he says, he ends it with this. He ends it with this. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in... uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, And he says, uh, forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Lord, let me do only what's right. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. We've heard that a million times. Do you know what that really means? We were, Tiz and I were doing the television uh, uh, broadcasting on Wednesday. And we were doing, when we, bro- when we film, it's for uh, next month or six weeks. And we're doing on First Fruits. Which first Fruits comes up three times a year. You come before the Lord and you don't come empty-handed. And Tiz said something on that. She said, you know, a lot of people look at that. In Malachi says, return unto me and I'll return to you. How do we return? In tithes and in offerings. And you know, we know, but most of the church world doesn't know when he says in tithes and offerings, that offering he's talking about is three times a year you come before the Lord and you don't come empty-handed. On Passover, Resurrection Sunday, on Shavuot, on Pentecost, and Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. These are the feast of old that Malachi is talking about. And God said, I'll open you up the windows of heaven. And Tis said, you know, a lot of times Christians read that and they go, that's Old Testament. That's, that's, that's not for us. That's Old Testament. And he says in that he said, the Lord says, for these are my feasts and they are my statutes to you forever. And I looked at that and I said, God, what are you saying there? Forever. So I looked it up in Hebrew. Here's an amazing thing. God says, whenever you see the word forever, it is a sign that God is saying to you, pay very, very close attention to what I'm telling you right here. Whenever you see the word forever, pay very, very close attention to what I'm saying right here. And so when we're talking about first fruits, he said, pay close attention because this is the key to the windows of heaven being opened up for you. And you start looking at it. He said, my name is glorified forever. My name is above every name forever. And he's saying, whenever you see the word forever, pay very close attention. This is like God putting a exclamation point of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And so at the end of this prayer, when he says, when we pray, say, Father, who art in heaven, I praise your name. You are the healer. You are the miracle worker. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Forgive us our trespasses. I forgive those who trespass against me. Lord, lead me not into temptation. Don't allow me to even stumble because I want to move quickly along to get to the presence of God. Deliver me from any evil so wherever I go, the light of God can shine and the more my light shines the more my soul grows up the ladder of God and when my soul grows he knows he can trust me with signs and wonders and miracles and the end time transfer of wealth for yours is the kingdom of God and he doesn't just say forever he says forever and ever and whenever you see something mentioned twice it's because god is revealing a secret and what that secret is that comes all the way from the dead sea scrolls that right before the messiah sets up in jerusalem the church of god and the people of god and the jewish people of god will see such a manifestation of the presence of god and the world will say when they look at god's power in your life and in my life surely they are dwelling in 
in the kingdom of God, and this kingdom of God now will last forever and ever and ever and ever, and somebody ought to shout amen. Folks, we're never going back down. We're going to do nothing but climb in the presence of God. The best is yet to come. When you look at what Jesus did in the first church, he said, that's nothing compared to what I'm going to do in the last church. Look at what I did. But the latter rain is going to be greater than the former. There are going to be blind eyes open. There are going to be cripples walking. There's going to be canceled healing of cancer. There's going to be babies that are going to be met by the miraculous power of God that drugs try to shoot them down. There's going to be miracle debt cancellation. There's going to be open windows of heaven where God is going to rebuke the devourer and he's going to say, Satan, get your hands off of my people. Don't ever touch them again. And we're not going to go back through the valley, but we're going to grow from glory to glory to glory. This is the best the world has ever seen and our best is yet to come. Somebody ought to shout amen. Stand with me all over the building. Deliver me from evil. Man, I don't know about you, but God speaking to me, he said, uh, when I read that, I said, God, deliver me from evil. Deliver me from worrying about myself. Deliver me from ever even thinking about fudging a little bit or, 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 or this a little bit because God, it's your kingdom and your kingdom. You know what? The kingdom of God, may it look like, listen, we've gone through probably the last 10, 12 years, we've gone through a period in the kingdom of God where there's been almost a silence of signs and wonders and miracles, but God is saying to us right now, get ready. If you'll give me all the praise and all the glory, I'm going to move in a way that all the world will know that the kingdom kingdom of God is not someday, but the kingdom of God is at hand right now. And God wants to do that through you and for you and in you in every single area. Our best is yet to come. Can I have an amen? It's such a simple thing. Every decision we make, there's the good dog and the bad dog. There's the good dog and the bad dog. And you know what? It's in us to say, mm, that, that, that bad dog looks like it'd be a, 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 a lot more beneficial, but it never will be. Understand, it may seem like it. It may look like it, but it never will be. It never will be. Always the good. We're living in a day and age in which I never dreamed I would see such evil in the world. I never, I never, did you? You know, when I first got saved 40-something years ago and they talked about as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, I thought, it's got to be something else, man. We're Americans. Bless God, we're men. And now all of a sudden, we're, 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 we're having to battle for our children that the school system doesn't tell them, well, you may not be really a boy or you may not really be a girl. You know, parents, when you hear that, that's the black dog and the white dog. That's the good dog and the bad dog. If your boy was born with boy plumbing, he's a boy. If your girl was born with girl plumbing, she's a girl. When it comes to, when it comes to our personal decisions, when it comes to voting, when it comes to any of these things. You know, Pastor Troy had to leave. He's, got, he's going down to the, the border to stand with, with our government here in, in, uh, in Texas uh, to, to close our borders up. Can I, can I brag on something? When I went to... When I went to um, when I went to, uh, when we went to D.C. to show the, what, the, what Hamas did to babies, murdered hundreds of babies, cut 40 babies' heads off with a hole, raped girl, un- unbelievably brutal. And we're not seeing it in our news anymore, so that's why I'm keeping it out there. Because Israel's not fighting just for themselves. They're fighting for us. They're, fight- they're fighting for us. But when we went over there, 
the morning before I went up there, a group of Jewish people, Jewish businessmen, I'm, in, I'm talking international businessmen, asked to meet. One, one I'd met, another I'd met on a Zoom call, and the other ones came in. And the reason why is they're saying, our world is going insane. We're thinking about changing the way we think on some things, but we're afraid of the evangelicals. And so they, they came in and said, we believe you're the voice. We believe you're the ambassador from the evangelicals to the Jewish community. And so they called me the other day from Spain and they had just met with the King of Spain. And because Spain is now the most anti-Semitic country in the world. And the king said, I'm very concerned about this because what's happening in the world with the evil of calling for the death of Jews is, is exactly how it started with Nazi Germany. And remember this, Hitler said, when we're done with the children of Saturday, we're coming after the children of Sunday. And that's exactly what Hamas said. And yet we're letting them come across our borders. We're supporting uh, Iran. We're doing all that. It's insanity. So think about that when it comes to voting. It doesn't matter what, how your parents voted, how your, how your grandparents voted. You, we we got to do what's right. We got to vote. Don't, you don't vote. You don't vote. You don't vote donkey. You don't vote elephant. You vote lamb of God. That's how you vote. And so the king said, what do we do? And they said, we're here with the king. They said, we, we, when you, we want you to come to Spain. We want you to meet with the king because we told them that God has a secret weapon in Dallas, Texas by the name of New Beginnings Church and Larry Huck Ministries. And, and he said, we went from there, we went from there and we went to Turkey. And in Turkey, we went to, and if you've ever been to Istanbul, it's not a, it's not a very safe place to go now, but there's a huge mosque there. There's these huge mosques there. One time it was a church, then it turned into a mosque, then it became a church again. It's a huge, massive thing. And these Jewish friends of ours, so they walked in there with the heads of Islam. And they looked in there, and it's now a mosque, and they had all these statues of Jesus covered with, with drapes and stuff. And so this Jewish friend said, well, let me ask you something. If you guys hate Jesus so much, why don't you just throw the statues out and get them out of the mosque? You know what this head of Islam said over there? We don't hate Jesus. We don't hate Jesus. We just can't be around Christianity because they have idols and images and statues and we're not allowed to have any graven images. And this Jewish friend of mine said, neither are we. He said, you know what? We need to introduce you to a pastor. He's our secret weapon in Dallas, Texas, that understands how to bridge that gap between Jews and Christians and Muslims. And then they came back and they met with Governor Abbott because the University of Texas was going to have a pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas speaker. So they went down to Governor Abbott. Do you know that by the end of this year, Texas will be the seventh largest economy in the world? Not, not in the United States, in the world, bigger than nations. And Governor Abbott said to these Jewish businessmen, why do you think that is? And they said, because God said, when you bless Israel, I will bless you. And of course, Governor Abbott stood against the BDS movement, which our group went down there at, in the Capitol and led that movement to stand against boycotting Israel and boycotting products. And, they, and Governor Abbott said, said, how do we keep this in Texas? And these Jewish businessmen said, we have a secret weapon in Dallas. It's called New Beginnings Church and Pastor Larry Huff. And Governor Abbott said, here's my number. You tell him if he needs me. And then the head of regencies of the University of Texas said, you need to call the president of Texas. You need to call the president of Texas, tell him you want to meet him and tell him what you said about these pro-Palestinian demonstrations, pro hamas And this Jewish friend said, the president of Texas, University of Texas will never see me. And, he, and the head of the board of regency said, you tell him, I said you're to meet with him and if you don't, his job is on the line. And so they went in there and met with him and he said, you know, you're absolutely right. Good dog, bad dog. And they threw the Palestinian speaker out and came to defeat. Come on, somebody. Did we can, your, 
you're, you have, Tiz says, Tiz says this always so well, you have no idea what's on the other side of your yes when God is telling you what to do. You have no idea what's on the other side. So let's get rid of, let's pray right now, and let's get rid of that evil inclination. Look at me, look at me one second. I wish I was, I wish I was smarter to say it better. You can't steal what God wants to give you. You can't take what God wants to give you. You can't, when the devil says just, you know, I, I, you know well, I, you know, I, when I, I remember years, years and years ago, they were saying, well, I'm not in the perfect will of God. I'm in the permissive will of God. Why would you be there? Because the, permer, the perfect will of God is Jesus saying, I've come to give you life and life. Water. Can I tell you one more thing? Should I tell them about what he said about winning the world? So they, they're flying me. I'm, I'm going to be on an international Zoom call with these business people from all over the world on w- this Wednesday. They want, they want me to speak to them. And then they're flying us to Jerusalem to meet at their convention. These are the biggest business people in the world. They, I mean, world banks and stuff. And they said, Pastor, your name has a name of excellence throughout the rabbis and the Jewish community, all through Europe, all through, because there's no, there's no hidden agenda. And you know what they said to me? You know what they said to me? Is, should I say it? Is it okay to say this about, you think? I think it's okay to say. They said, we met with a council of leading rabbis and we want you to tell the world about Jesus. And, and I said, I said, uh, what? They said, because the Jesus you're giving the world is a Jewish Jesus. And a Jewish Jesus is causing the world to love Israel and love their Jewish brothers and sisters. And so we want to accelerate everything that you're doing. Can you imagine how, I I, I still can't get my head around what he said. We want you to tell the world about Jesus. And I said, "I, I gotta, I gotta admit, I don't understand what you're saying. They said, because you're giving the world a Jewish Jesus. You know, 18 years ago when we came here, we came here and we were in the other building and we blew up to about three or 4,000 people in six months. We filled the old TBN building, we were packed out. And then I stood against Obama because Obama was pro-abortion. And I said, I wish Obama, I wish Obama was a black woman that cooked Mexican food and spoke Hebrew because we need people of color in leadership of this country. But you can't vote for him when he's pro killing babies. You can't, you, as a Christian, you can't do it. I don't care, I don't care who he is. I don't care what, you, you understand what I'm saying? And I started getting accused of being a racist when every church we built has been on purpose to tear down. T.D. Jake spoke in our church in Portland. Our church is half African-American. He said, how do you do it? I said, you do it on purpose. You got to do it on purpose. And T.D. Jake said, you need to show me how to do this. And so we, we in, in, in two Sundays, we lost 3,000 people. And we started getting banned by the Christian community by talking about the Jewish roots. This is 18 years ago. Now I speak all over. I'm going to speak to the king of Spain about Jewish roots, Jewish roots. But... The only reason I'm telling you this is every one of those decisions, the black dog looks like, you know, the black wolf, the, 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 it looks like, you know, if I just compromise a little bit. But if you don't compromise, do what God says to do. Do, what, do what's right. Forgive people. Don't gossip. Don't backbite. Be honest. You know, we live in a day and age, you, gotta, you, you sign something, you got to have 80 pieces of paper when you sign everything. It used to be, you know what? If I tell you I'm going to do it, I'm doing it. You can, you can take, can they take, can they take your word? If we're honest, listen, the best is yet to come. It's going to be amazing. And God's looking for people to do it. Amen. Let's lift our hands up before the Lord. Say this out loud. Say, Father, I come to you right now 
in the name of Jesus. I know I've sinned. We've all sinned. But I know this. You love me so much. You sent Jesus to pay the price in full for all my sin. Right now, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Now say it out loud. You got authority. Satan, get out of my life. Get out of my mind. Get out of my body. Get out of my spirit. Get out of my home, my family, my finances, and my future. I declare through the name, through the blood, and the Holy Spirit, evil in me is defeated. I'm feeding the good dog from now on in Jesus' name. Somebody's going to get blessed. It might as well be us. Give the Lord a clap offering. Amen.